This conference will now be recorded. Okay, so uh, today is, uh, as we already uh, said it last week, um, we will start uh, a kind of uh, new approach to uh, uh, a new point of view, I should say, on, uh, dis on disordered systems. And today we would like to understand uh, the effects of uh, of this order uh, on low temperature phase and on phase transitions. So the scope will be a bit different uh, from what, uh, and the goal say will be different uh, from what uh, we have seen up to now. And what we have in mind uh, in, this, uh, in these lectures uh, is really to understand uh, the effects of a weak disorder. Okay, so that's somehow opposed to uh, the strong disorder uh, situation that you have encountered uh, in mean field spin glasses, for instance. And uh, what we would like to understand uh, is basically whether the, uh, the, the, the weak disorder present uh, in the sample uh, will change the critical properties, in particular the existence of phase transitions. Um, and we will keep in mind that uh, the disorder is weak, and what we would like to have uh, and to develop is a kind of perturbative approach uh, to, to, the, to the presence of disorder. So uh, I will start uh, uh, by presenting two qualitative arguments. Uh, Essentially, uh, one which is called the Emrim argument, and second, uh, the uh, the Harris criterion. So uh, I will not probably go into too much into the the, the, the detailed calculations, uh, but instead I will try to give you some kind of arguments, scaling arguments. Uh, uh, some of them will not be 100% uh, rigorous, as you will see, but I will try to uh, to give the arguments and indicate um, the, the the limit of, of validity as much as possible. And uh, eventually, as uh, the last part, we will study uh, disordered elastic systems, which will also be the topic of the uh, of the uh, the tutorial, by the way. So let's start uh, with a very uh, short reminder uh, on the Ising model. Pure pure system. So. Or maybe I should say that uh, the, 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 my notes actually are available on the website or on the Dropbox, uh, whatever. Uh, so uh, it might, might be useful for you to have uh, to have it uh, at hand, such that it might help to to follow if there is something which is not very clear on the blackboard. So the purizing system, uh, and that will serve uh, as a as a good example uh, during basically the first or the three parts, the first three parts of this uh, of this. Uh, of these lectures, and uh, that will be uh, simply uh, something like that. So that's the purizing model, and it's defined typically uh, on Z to the D, okay? And of course, the sigma i's are just uh, plus or mi minus uh, ising ising variable. Now. Uh, as you, as is well known, and as as you know, uh, the phase diagram uh, is the following. At least, uh, if I look at what happens, say, uh, in d uh, greater or equal than two, uh, if I look at it uh, in the uh, say h t plane, well, uh, you know that if h is equal to zero, uh, there is a critical temperature here. And on this line here, uh, we have a first order phase transition on the line. Is the blue readable or uh, usually it's not very nice? And here, of course, at TC, uh, we have a second order phase transition. And in the equal one, uh, the situation is a bit special uh, because TC uh, is just equal to zero, uh, as you know. And uh, 
one uh, very interesting, uh, very interesting uh, uh, feature is what happens at this critical temperature, which essentially separates a ferromagnetic phase at low temperature from a paramagnetic phase at high temperature. Okay, so you have these two phases and you have the critical point and uh, things uh, are very well, essentially quite well understood there. Uh, let me just remind something that will be useful in the following uh, is that uh, there is a direct relation between TC and J here, okay? Uh, you see that J is the only, I mean, at least uh, for H equal to zero, uh, J is the only energy scale in, the, in, in your system and TC uh, is basically some number say C times J, okay, so it's just a number. So TC and J essentially are, are the same, are the same quantity, and C can be computed exactly for the, uh, for the, for instance, for the 2D Ising model, it's just two divided by log of one plus square root of two. Anyway, that's just a, that's just a number. Uh, and uh, of course, associated to that, uh, to that critical point, uh, there are uh, various exponents, critical exponents that characterize uh, the critical, the critical, the critical, uh, critical behavior. So if you look at the critical point, uh, well, uh, this is characterized by a set of critical exponents, and the whole part of the, uh, I mean, at least an important part of the the, the course during the first uh, semester, I guess, for for all of you. Uh, was uh, the study of of these uh, of these uh, transitions and uh, the computation or the study of uh, the associated critical exponent? Let me just uh, mention what this what I mean by that to be just a little bit more precise. Uh, well, there is the correlation length uh, xi, uh, which diverges close to Tc uh, as an exponent with an exponent nu. Is, can you read what I write uh, on the, on the, on, uh, up to that point here? Yes, yes, we can. Okay, thank you. Right. Okay, so the correlation length has this uh, behavior. The magnetization uh, has also an algebraic behavior close to the critical point, uh, which is characterized by an exponent beta. And yet, uh, for instance, another exponent. Uh, will be, which will play a role later, uh, is the specific heat at fixed volume, uh, which is typically, uh, is at least has a singular behavior generically, uh, which is uh, characterized by an exponent, an exponent alpha. You can actually define uh, other uh, exponents, but at the end of the day, as you know, there were only two, uh, only two uh, independent exponents. because there are some relations between them, which are called uh, hyperscaling relations. And let me just mention one of them, uh, which will be uh, useful in the following, which is that alpha, for instance, is just two minus nu d nu. This is not the only one, but this is one uh, which will be useful in the following. So again, uh, this problem is relatively well understood in the sense that uh, well, we can solve it exactly in d equals one and two, and uh, in higher dimensions, with there are various approaches that uh, allows to uh, compute uh, perturbatively uh, these exponents. For instance, you have the uh, renormalization group techniques, or more recently, uh, this bootstrap approach. Um, anyway, uh, one should say that the situation is, is, is quite well understood. Now, what we want to, 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 to understand and there the problem is, is much harder, is what happens to this kind of phase diagram and to these exponents when you add this order, okay? So these are the various questions. Uh, let me just... Uh, so the question is really what happens when you add some disorder. And again, I uh, will have in mind here that I really just had uh, a very small number of impurities in the system. So I have a disorder which is expected to be weak. And that means that uh, the, the pure system uh, is typically a good starting point to describe the system. 
and you would like to understand uh, how this uh, scenario, the pure uh, phases, are modified in the presence of a small disorder. So, for instance, our uh, first question that you would like to understand is does the order of phase survive? Okay, that's probably the, the most natural one. that you would like to, to understand. That means you know that these phases at low temperature uh, is ordered, okay? There is a, a finite, uh, I mean, the, 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 the order parameter takes a non-zero value, in that case, the magnetization in this ordered phase. And you might expect that uh, if the disorder uh, is too strong, uh, you will completely destroy this phase. Uh, now what you are, I mean, well, what is quite natural to wonder is whether this, if this disorder is small, uh, is there still some uh, reminiscence of this uh, ordered phase, or is it already destroyed as soon as you add some infinitesimally small uh, amount of disorder? Now, the other questions uh, then uh, that uh, that uh, that that you can ask, if 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 yes, uh, that means uh, in that case uh, uh, there will probably exist a TC. Then uh, you would like to know whether the critical behavior is affected or not. Okay, so typically, uh, does the disorder modify the critical exponent? Are they modified or are they just uh, essentially uh, the same as, as you had uh, in, the, in, the, in the pure case? Now, of course, uh, we know that uh, the critical exponents uh, in, in pure systems, uh, as you have studied, uh, we know that the diverse, I mean, the various critical exponents, they actually defined a different universality classes. And of course, a natural question is then, uh, if the exponents are modified, uh, then one would expect a new universality classes to emerge uh, due to the presence of disorder. And one would like to have a sort of classification of these different universality classes. Okay, so this is uh, uh, related questions. Uh, what are the universality classes? Disordered universality classes, if you want. That means that does it depend on the kind of disorder that you put, right? I mean, in your uh, later on, we will take this J and H as random, as we have already seen before. Uh, you might ask whether you would expect a different behaviors uh, if the J's, for instance, are Gaussian random variables, or if they are only, I don't know, distributed uh, uniformly on a given interval, or whether these are exponential random variables, and so on and so forth. Okay, so what kind of universal behavior uh, is there? Uh, still uh, present uh, when you add this order. Okay, so that's that's what that's what that's what we we want to answer here. So we will partly uh, try to answer these questions. I mean, of course, uh, they, uh, I will not exhaust uh, the complete uh, the, the subject completely. But I would like to present you the standard and basic arguments uh, that allow uh, at least to uh, get a feeling uh, using uh, scalings. Uh, to get a feeling uh, and try to to to, to answer these these questions uh, at least in a qualitative way. So the first uh, argument that I want to present, uh, which is quite famous nowadays uh, in disordered system, uh, which is called the Imrima argument. Argument, sorry. Uh, this was proposed uh, already quite some time back in 1975, and um, to illustrate it, uh, again, I will uh, start with a, a random uh, uh, a randomizing model, but I will consider the case where I only have a random field. Random field, I should say. Okay, so that's what I will call the random field Ising model. And uh, that means I will essentially look at the, the Hamiltonian, which is the following. Uh, 
uh, so the, the sigma i, sigma j, so the couplings are uniform. So that, I mean, this is, this, these are just constants. Yeah, maybe something I should have mentioned, of course, uh, is that here uh, I'm looking at the case where j is positive. Okay. So I have a positive, uh, positive j here again, but uh, the, the, the random field, so the, the fields uh, are random. Okay, so that means that uh, I have couplings now which are of that type, and the hi's are random variables. Okay, so typically here I will look at the case where so hi's are random, and I will not specify uh, so much the distribution of the hi's, except that um, I want I will focus on the case where hi's on average uh, are zero. Okay, so I'm somehow on this line there, but in presence of this order now. So on average, h is zero, and uh, I will uh, insist on having a finite variance. So I want the h i squared uh, to be well defined and equal to some parameter delta h squared. Okay, and the question is uh, is the following: is basically uh, I will start at well, we look at what happens at t equal to zero. So today, uh, to a large extent, we will focus mainly on what happens at, at zero temperature. So we will not touch too much the, the, the case of finite t, uh, because it turns out that, uh, well, the zero temperature case is, 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 is quite, uh, I mean, it's already quite rich on the one hand, and on the other hand, uh, allows to understand most of the physics of these systems. I will come to that a bit later. So we assume that, uh, suppose that we are, say, at, at equal zero here, and we look at the ground state of the system. Okay, so uh, you are, suppose that you are at equal to zero, and basically you, you have your system, say in 2D, just to, for illustration. And imagine that uh, you are imposing uh, some uh, boundaries field here, which are plus, or you, or you fix the spins at the boundaries, so that to select one of the two ground states. And the ground state uh, for the pure system uh, will be uh, typically uh, will be typically of that uh, of that. So that's that's the. So in the absence of of this order. Uh, the, the ground state uh, is just is just is just a plus like that. Okay. And now uh, now you 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 assume that you add you add some disorder, and you want to know whether this uh, this ground state is stable uh, in the presence of disorder. Okay. So you add disorder, but small disorder. Small disorder means that delta H there, uh, which is a characteristic strength of the disorder. Uh, is much smaller than j. And you want to understand uh, how much energy does it cost, say, to return the spins on a given domain. So you are, you, you are asking what happens or what, how much energy does it cost uh, just to return the spins here and just to, to make such a droplet of minus uh, spins inside this C of plus spins, and you would like to know whether uh, this is energetically favorable for the system to create such an, excit such an excitation, or whether uh, it, this is not. Okay, so let's call this uh, this domain, uh, say omega. Yeah, maybe I should stop with the with the, the yellow, and I will assume that. Uh, the, the typical size of omega uh, is just uh, L to the power D, okay? So the, the, the size of that uh, is just L to the power D, okay? So what it means is that the linear size of this, of this domain here is, is simply L, okay? And I want to compute uh, the cost in energy to create such a droplet. So if I look at the expression, which is, Upstairs, well, uh, it's 
relatively easy to see that if I look at uh, the cost in energy to create this guy, this droplet here, so I first need, so I, I first uh, have an amount of energy which is due to the fact that here I will pay an energy at the border of this of this domain and which is due to the ferromagnetic coupling and the cost will be simply 2 times J times uh, the surface of the boundary of, of omega uh, which is just L to the power D minus 1 okay because this is just uh, the surface term that, that contributes to that and then I have this term which is due to the fact that I have returned all the, the, all, all the spins inside and the cost for that is just the sum uh, for I belonging to omega of HI. Okay. So now this quantity here uh, is clearly uh, is a random variable. So when L is sufficiently large, uh, these HIs, you see, they are just independent. I should have said it here. Uh, is that if I just compute h i h j, this is just equal to zero if i is not equal to j. So I have a sum of random variables, independent ones, and I can just use the central limit theorem to estimate the uh, statistical behavior of this sum here. And what the central limit theorem tells me is that uh, this, uh, this sum here, so typically uh, will be a random variable which will be of that form, which will be of the form square root of delta h squared l to the d. Okay, so l l to the d is the number of variables that I have. So the typical fluctuations are of the order of square root of the number of these terms, which is then the square root of l to the d times the variance of h i. And then uh, I will have this will be just multiplied if you want by a random variable here y which is just uh, a gaussian uh, random uh, random variable okay so i could just uh, write it this way so the full term here will be will be like that and this y here is just uh, a gaussian random variable say n01 but what is important is that this this y here is independent of l okay so this is a number which is of order l to the zero okay that's fine so now uh, i need to compare these two terms there okay now of course uh, if y is positive uh, it will always uh, cost something and there is no reason why the system would like to create such a domain but of course y is a gaussian random variable so it can also be negative okay so it might be indeed that if this term here basically if the amplitude of this term here is larger than the surface term here then this will be always favorable for the system to create such a droplet here of opposite uh, opposite signs so in other words uh, this uh, delta e so what I, what I want to say is that it can be negative if what well if basically this quantity here so that means if delta is 2d delta h l to the d to the power 2 uh, is then uh, is then uh, larger than 2j say uh, to the power l to the power d minus one okay so let's forget about the factor of two now l is large so that tells you that this l here so that equality uh, can be verified if so this is this this is the case uh, so this is indeed the case if this exponent d by 2 is greater than d minus 1 which if you just solve this in equation inequality uh, gives you that d is pretty less than d over 2 
Okay, so what it tells, I mean, what this argument tells by balancing the energy on the one hand, that, sorry, the, 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 the ferromagnetic coupling on the one hand, and the random field on the other hand, uh, is uh, that it will be always favorable uh, for the system to create such an excitation here, provided d is less than two. So typically in d equals to one, uh, you will completely destroy this, uh, this order, even at zero temperature, right? And even at zero temperature, uh, what you will see is that you will have uh, a phase coexistence of plus domains and minus domains. Uh, but you will have uh, you won't have any finite magnetization now on the other hand uh, in d strictly greater than two what it says is that uh, at least if delta is small then this situation can still be uh, can still be uh, be stable and in d equal in d say larger than two the pure ground state might be uh, might be stable. So, on the other hand, uh, if d uh, is greater strictly than two, uh, then the pure ground state is stable. At least uh, for delta h small. Okay, I, I'm looking at here. I'm, I'm looking at here at the, the limit where delta h is is much much smaller than j. Okay. Yeah, maybe one remark uh, about what uh, what is written here. Um, uh, you might uh, claim that there is a problem of uh, homogeneity in that formula, but of course, what you need to understand is that this L here. Uh, okay, it's it's not really L. I mean, you should you should see that this is just L divided by the lattice spacing. Okay, so all the all the, 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 the lengths are counted in the unit of the lattice spacing. So this L here is just a dimensionless variable. Okay? So there is no problem of homogeneity uh, anywhere here. Right. So that's, uh, that's what it says. Now in D equals two, D equals two is a kind of, uh, uh, is kind of, of, of marginal here, if, you, if, 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 I, if I can say. But if you look at this formula, so in D equals two, it's it's a bit uh, it's indeed a bit particular because this number here scales like L, and this one also scales like L in D equals to two. But you see, uh, this Y here can be uh, can be as large and negative as I wish. Okay, so that that means that there is a finite probability that Y can be extremely large and negative because it's an unbounded uh, random variable, and that means that if the system is sufficiently large. I will always find a region where I can find uh, uh, and create such a huge domain. And uh, the result of that uh, is that in D equals two, uh, it turns out that uh, uh, the situation is the same as, as in D, as in D, uh, as in D less than two. Okay, so if D equals two, uh, one can show uh, that uh, the, the order is also is also destroyed. Again, because of the arguments that I just that I just mentioned. Okay, so basically the conclusion, uh, and that's the the, the, the take-home message uh, about this Imrima argument, is that in D uh, equals one and two. Well, basically uh, there is no ferromagnetic order. No thermal magnetic order can survive uh, in the presence of a small disorder. So, as I mean, even if you have a very small disorder, while uh, so, even if you have a small disorder, uh, then if the system is sufficiently large, uh, you will completely uh, destroy the. Uh, the uh, the ferromagnetic order. On the other hand, if d is greater or say or equal than three, uh, there is still a magnetization at small delta. There is still uh, order. That means finite magnetization in this case. 
that's what I'm that's what I mean here for small delta for small disorder okay so in other words uh, you have this uh, kind of uh, phase diagram here uh, <clears throat> so in small dimensions uh, you see that the disorder the effect of disorder are actually quite dramatic and if you look at what happens say in the delta h t plane okay so h is equal to zero here so sorry h equal to zero sorry uh, h is a random variable um, so as a function of delta h uh, you still have a critical temperature but only in the uh, a delta h equal to zero okay but as soon as uh, so on this line here you have a ferromagnetic but everywhere else you have a paramagnetic phase so that's the situation in d equals one and two Now, if you look at what happens uh, in dimension larger, say in D equals to three, for instance, uh, well, the situation is different there. And what happens is that um, you still have a finite region of the space of phase diagram, if you want, uh, where you have some sort of magnetic order. So at zero temperature, I'll say it's zero disorder. You have the, the well-known, uh, the well-known line that we that 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 that, that 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 we know. But even if delta H is finite, you might still preserve the ferromagnetic order, and uh, you might even eventually have a transition uh, to a paramagnetic to a paramagnetic phase when you increase the disorder. Okay. So this is the Imrima, standard Imrima argument. Uh, there is a huge uh, literature on that. I could give you some references if you wish. Um, I've discussed here the kind, the, 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 the situation of short range of short range interactions, but you can also study long range. Uh, uh, I mean, to, I say sorry. I've discussed here the the, the, the case of a discrete symmetry. Excuse me. Uh, the case where the sigma i's are just plus minus one, so there is a Z2 symmetry. But one may also study the ON model, exactly as we did for, for pure systems. Um, and in that case, of course, uh, uh, the, the criterion is, is, is slightly modified, that instead of having D equals two as a critical dimension, uh, the critical dimension becomes D equals to four, uh, simply because instead of having L to the power D minus one, uh, you will get L to the power D minus two, uh, I will not comment too much on that uh, if you don't have any questions. Right. Excuse me. I have one question. Yes, please. Yes, please. Um, here, the disorder that we introduce is uh, on the HIs. Is it possible yeah. to introduce disorder another way, like for instance on the Js or maybe on yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, so, so so here I discussed the case of the random field, but you can also discuss what is called a random bond. And you can reproduce the same kind of uh, the same kind of arguments will hold. Yeah, definitely. Okay, thank you. Okay. So by simply uh doing the same kind of analysis, right? That is uh using uh central limit theorem to analyze the terms which would be these J I J, sigma I, sigma J. Okay, and you will end up with the same, uh, essentially, with the same uh, same kind of criterion. Now, just a remark: uh, this, this 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 argument uh, was presented in '75. The, at that, that time, the random field Isaac model uh, was really at the center of the the the, the of the scene, uh, and everyone was working on that model, and. Um, Okay, uh, it took actually quite some time uh, to show that this is indeed, that this argument, or this Imrima argument, is actually correct. Uh, in particular, there was at that time, there is uh, uh, it's just, it's just a, a remark. Uh, uh, that uh, 
at the same time, uh, there was uh, another uh, theory, uh, which was more from the point of view of field theory, uh, which was called uh, so the Imrima uh, argument. Uh, was uh, basically um, uh, in contradiction with another approach, which I, I'm just mentioning here, uh, was in contradiction with what was called the dimensional reduction, which was basically saying the following, that uh, a disordered system Uh, in say d equals to uh, d equals to uh, basically uh, in, the, in, in dimension d uh, is actually uh, equivalent in some sense uh, to a pure system at sorry in dimension d minus two. And that was uh, indeed uh, a bit. Uh, that was indeed a bit uh, strange because uh, it turns out that the Imrima argument can also be extended to finite temperature in a, in a quite uh, quite straightforward, straightforward way, and it would predict the phase diagram that I've shown you upstairs, and in particular that at finite temperature you will still see a ferromagnetic phase if the disorder is not too small. But according to that argument, uh, that would say that the disordered system in 3D, for instance, is exactly as the pure system in D equals 1. And in D equals 1, we know that at finite temperature, there is no order. So, uh, so, for, ex so for, for example, uh, random field Ising model uh, in D equals 3 uh, would be equivalent uh, to the pure system, to pure Ising. Uh, in D equals one, and well, uh, we know that uh, this is this is not this is not possible. I mean, at least people knew that it was not possible because first the Imrima argument was uh, so there is no ordered phase at t strictly positive, and there was there was an apparent contradiction. Okay, because Numerical simulation and the Imrima argument uh, was contradicting uh, this. This uh, and it took some time to solve this uh, this problem, and eventually uh, the problem was actually there was uh, a rigorous proof uh, first by Imri and then by Brickmo and Kupianen in '84 and then '87. Uh, for the the G equals three random fieldizing model, showing that there was indeed uh, a phase transition, there was indeed a, a, an ordered phase uh, in D equal to three, according and in agreement with the Imrima uh, type of uh, argument. And in D equal two, this was proven a bit later by Eisenman and Ver, uh, which are I mean these these people are mathematical physicists, uh, and they really produced uh, rigorous uh, rigorous proof uh, of this uh, for for this uh, for this uh, for this model. So, just one comment. If I have not time to, uh, uh, to 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 just to yeah to to comment more on that on this dimensional reduction problem, it took some time to to for I mean to people to realize in fact that this dimensional reduction result was actually the result of a, in the language of replicas that you know. Um, it turns out that this is equivalent to a replica symmetric solution, and the way out. Uh, from dimensional reduction, at least from the mean field uh, point of view, is to uh, actually uh, find a solution uh, with, which, which breaks the replica symmetry. Okay. Now, from the point of view of, of field theory, uh, this actually m means, and this was realized uh, much l later, that the field theory that describes this system is extremely uh, more complicated than the one that, uh, that one has to deal with for pure systems. And uh, this led to the, uh, the development of what is called the functional renormalization group, where instead of uh, following the RG flow of a coupling constant, as you would do for FIFO theory, where you just look at 
the copying constant j of the j5 four terms. In fact, you need to follow the, the RG uh, flow of the whole function, hence the name of functional renormalization group, which is related to the distribution of the disorder. And this was also another way out of this, uh, of this, of this problem. So that's, that's, that's a quite important result, this Imrima type of argument, and it can be adapted to other situations. So uh, one of you just asked whether one can adapt it to uh, other types of disorder like random bond, and the answer, as I said, is yes. It can also be adapted to uh, various types of models like the, um, the for instance, um, polymers in random media, uh, which is related to what we will study a bit later today. And there, it has a slightly different name. This is sometimes called the Flory argument, uh, but this is again the same type of uh, same type of reasoning. Is that clear? Is there any question? Okay. So this tells you, or this tells us, uh, whether uh, the the ordered phase are stable or not. Now, what you would like to 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 know is whether uh, the, the the if if the, 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 there is still a critical point um, whether the, the disorder will change or modify the critical behavior. Okay, so that has to do with the second question that, uh, that we had before. And this is, uh, I mean, a criterion for that is a high risk, high risk criterion, uh, which Harris uh, wrote in uh, 74. It's a rather qualitative argument in scaling one, and I will try to explain you what Harris uh, meant. Uh, it's quite non-rigorous, and it can be proved in some cases, but not in full generality, but it can be proved in some cases. And the question is whether, uh, again, the disorder, if you want, is uh, a relevant perturbation in the sense of renormalization group, okay? So, again, one has in mind uh, that the disorder is very small, and instead of the random field Isaac model, it's slightly easier to discuss the uh, Harris criterion on the random bond Isaac model. Okay, so I just make the discussion uh, for simplicity or clarity on the random bond Isaac model. But in principle, one can also do it. Uh, one can also do it on the. Uh, on the on the random field but so here i have no field and i just have a gij a sigma i sigma j and what i have in mind is that gij is essentially uh, a pure number so uh, like uh, in the homogeneous case but plus sorry plus a small perturbation which i will call epsilon ij and i have in mind that epsilon ij is very small okay so uh, this epsilon ij, I will take them as iid, so independent and identically distributed uh, random variables. And again, uh, I will assume that uh, their expectation value is, uh, is just zero and that they have a finite variance. which is delta j squared. And I will assume that, again, delta j is much, much smaller than j, okay? So that's, that's, that's what I want to study. This can be realized in various ways. I mean, in the notes you will see, I just described a situation where I have a site diluted uh, Ising model. So that means that I have an Ising model, but some links are present now, the links are present with some probability p and absent with probability 1 minus p. And you can, in that, in that case, realize uh, such a situation, but there, there are others. But keep in mind that uh, gij has this, has this shape here, okay? And epsilon, sorry, delta j here is, is much smaller than 1. So the situation, again, is uh, since, since I assume this situation, uh, I always have in mind that the, a good reference point is what happens at for the pure system, okay? So I will imagine that I will drive the system, I will put the system very close to the critical temperature of the pure system, okay? So I will assume such a situation where 
I have this, uh, if I just draw the temperature axis. So this is temperature. So here somewhere I have the TC uh, of the pure system. Let me just choose, yeah, TC pure. Okay. And I will assume that I'm just looking at what happens at the system. So I'm just looking at what happens close to the critical temperature, to the pure critical temperature. Okay. And of course I have in mind that if this is true, then then uh, the, the the true TC, if it exists at all, uh, should be close to this TC pure. Okay. This is an assumption. Now the argument is as follows: is that um, if I am slightly above the, the critical temperature, then uh, the system, there is a, a finite correlation length in the system, and it's quite uh, useful to think of the system as blocks of size xi, uh, each block, each of these blocks uh, behaving essentially in, independently. So that means that I have this picture, uh, which I just draw, uh, say, in 2D, but uh, this can be done in principle, of course, in any dimension. So I have this uh, I have this situation here, and I divide the system in subsystem which are of size xi of t, where xi is the correlation length of the system, which indeed, since t is close to Tc, uh, should be quite large. Now the argument was as follows, and what we want to study is the following: is that now if I look at each of these blocks, you see. Uh, they are sort of independent uh, subsystems. And since the j's are random, the gi's are random, or the epsilon ij's are random, one can imagine that uh, there is each of these blocks, if you want, have its own critical temperature. OK? So I will just denote this Tc of, say, of the sample one, uh, Tc of the block two. Sorry, I want to talk about blocks. Three, etc. Now, the Harris criterion uh, is wants to estimate the fluctuations of this TC, and two situations might occur: either all the TCs are basically the same, so that means that the the, the distribution of the TCs is very narrow, and that will mean that basically all the blocks will behave in the same way. So all each of these blocks uh, will be in the ferromagnetic or paramagnetic phase at the same time. And therefore, essentially everything will happen as in the pure system. While if the distribution of the TCs is very large, well, in that case, uh, I might be in trouble because that means that this block could be in the ferromagnetic phase, while this one would be in the paramagnetic phase, and so on and so forth. And in that case, I would have a patchwork of systems, each one being uh, in an ordered or disordered phase, and that would basically uh, destroy the, uh, the, 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 the critical behavior, if you want. Okay? So that's, that, that's what the, 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 the Harris criterion wants to do. So how can, when I do that, how, how, can, how, how, how can I do that? Well, um, we have seen that, uh, we have already mentioned before, that for the pure system, uh, TC uh, is related to J, this effective coupling here, J, the, the, the ferromagnetic coupling, sorry. So what I would like to, to, to what, what I want to say is that TC is roughly speaking uh, the same thing as the JIJs, but averaged over this block. Okay, so that, sorry, that's why I, I, will, I will estimate this TC1 or the TC of, of one block, if you want. So the, the idea is the following, is that in each block, you see, uh, I will just define an effective coupling, GF, which will be uh, the average over the number of spins inside the blocks or the number of bones, which is more or less the same, one over n blocks, which is now the sum of our ij belonging to this block, say the block one, for instance, 
of the GIJ. Okay, so that's that's what I want to uh, to, to estimate. And roughly speaking, what, what what I have in mind is that the TC of the block, TC of the of this block, uh, is basically some number, say time, call it C if you want, times this J effective. Okay. And of course, uh, so n, n blocks here is just the number of of bones in the block here. Okay. N blocks. Can you read what I write here? Yes. Okay. So this is just the number of bones inside the block. Okay, and this is roughly the, the number of, of spins that I have, okay, since I have just nearest neighbors interaction here. So n blocks is basically the number of spins that I have inside this block, which is psi of t to the power d. All right? So fine. Uh, let's now substitute what these gijs are. So gijs, they are a deterministic number, so we get that the temperature, the TC of a block is proportional to uh, one over, so there is a first quantity which I can, so the first, there is a term which is a constant, which is J, so I can just get it out, so TC will be just uh, essentially this, uh, uh, yeah, maybe just let's do it this way. So G effective uh, will be J plus one over this number of blocks times the sum over all the couplings of this GIJ. So, but, but this now I only have the, the, the epsilon IJ. And as before, uh, I suppose that psi is sufficiently large because I'm close to the putative critical temperature. And this is can be this sum can be estimated using the low, I mean central limit theorem or law of large numbers of central limit theorem. And what it gives is simply that uh, this is just uh, so I have divided here by one over n blocks. So the order of that uh, is simply that this is just over the square root of n blocks times the variance of this guy, uh, which is Delta J, yeah. Let's write it this way. Okay. Fine. Now, GS minus J, uh, since I have this this identity here, uh, is just the temperature of the block. Let's write the things like that. So I have the TC of the block minus the TC of the pure system, okay? Because J is just the critical temperature of the pure system. And this is roughly, I mean, this is proportional to uh, this quantity here, which is delta J, okay? Divided by square root of N blocks, which is uh, delta J, say, times psi of T to the power minus D over two. Okay, fine. So now I need to, uh, to, 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 to if, if I want to make progress now, uh, so that, that's quite nice, you see, because that gives me um, exactly what I was after. That means that that gives me uh, the, the order of magnitude of the fluctuations of TC from one sample to another with respect to the TC pure. Okay, so that means that I have uh, a delta TC, uh, that's the way I will uh, call this, uh, this quantity. I will call this guy delta TC block. Sorry. And 
And this is roughly speaking psi of t to the power minus d by two. Okay. So so that means that I have uh, an estimate of this guy, of the delta of the, of the strength of the, the, the distribution, if you want, of the, the width of the, the, the distribution of the T C. So that gives me that gives me essentially some so I have this scale here. Delta T C block. Okay. So now you see uh two kinds of solution. Uh, I mean now I can actually test so sort of consistently my, my approach. So I would say that if this quantity here is delta T C block is very small compared to that temperature here, then that means that I see the system as a pure one in the sense that the fluctuations are very small and basically there are some fluctuations, but they are very small compared to the T minus T C pure where I actually stand. And that means that in such cases, the delta T C block, uh, I can just ignore the fluctuations if you want, and just assume that the system will behave as critical as in the as a critical system as in the pure case. Okay. So on the other hand, you see that if delta T C is very large, that means that if I have some critical temperatures which are very widespread compared to that temperature scale, then of course that means that my reasoning is not consistent. And in that case that means that the uh the critical uh behavior will be destroyed. Okay. So let's uh I will write this uh, in a more uh, mathematical way, and that will produce the, uh, this Harris criterion. Before that, uh, I will just make an, an additional assumption, uh, which is that you see here I'm again assuming that the the the, the TC, uh, so sorry, that the 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 epsilon ij, so delta delta j is very small, so it's quite reasonable to assume that the psi t, which is governed by the new exponent, will be basically the same as in the pure system. Okay, so that's something that I need, of course, to check consistently afterwards. That's what we will do there. But what I want to say is that this is just t minus tc to the power nu d by 2. And the nu that I have here, I will call it nu pure. This is the nu of the pure system. So I have assumed, so that's that's what I have assumed, is that psi of t uh, behaves like t minus tc. That's an assumption to the power of minus pure, which is the new pure of the uh, of the pure system. Okay. So then, let me rephrase mathematically what I would say. I would say that the disorder is unimportant. Or say irrelevant, I should say, in fact, in the language of a normalization group. So I will have that this order is unimportant. And to be more precise, because this is really what you can show, or what you can test using field theory, uh, is irrelevant in the RG sense. Well, if, if what? As I said, if the delta TC of the, of the, of the, so the, the width of the fluctuations of TC is actually much smaller than T minus TC pure, because this is what I'm studying now. Okay. So I am just, I was looking at close to TC pure and I wanted to estimate the uh, scale of fluctuations. Now, of course, here, uh, I should have been, uh, again, because delta J is very small, I mean, uh, this TC, which is here, is, of course, the pure one. Okay, keep in mind that everything here, what I'm doing, uh, is in the limit where delta J is much smaller than J. Of course, this would be not valid uh, if, this would not be valid, of course, if this guy becomes large, if, if delta J becomes large. And so now this delta T C block, I mean I have I have just I got I got there here. So I get uh if I if I just have this delta J, whatever, 
uh, let me forget about the delta j now and just look at the t minus the powers of t minus tc so i get t minus tc pure so this is to the power new pure d divided by 2 and i want this to be much smaller than t minus tc pure okay but now i need to sorry i need to remember that t minus tc pure so this quantity here is very small okay so that means that the disorder is unimportant if this exponent is greater than one okay so that means that this is just uh, equivalent to again remember that t minus tc pure is small so that means that i need to have new pure times t uh, is actually uh, so this is irrelevant so that means that this is greater uh, greater than one uh, which is new pure minus 2d new pure d times d sorry minus do my minus two is positive okay and this quantity is actually minus if I use the, the hyperscaling relation uh, that I gave you that I gave you before, uh, this is just minus alpha of the pure system. So in other words, so which is a specific heat exponent. So in other words, the Aris criterion tells you that the disorder is irrelevant when alpha. when alpha uh, is negative of course you can do uh, the same i mean the, 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 you can now reverse the argument saying that the disorder on the other hand will be important if there is a wide this uh, sorry a uh, large uh, wide distribution of the delta tc and of course the inequality will be reversed so that means that the disorder is relevant when alpha is strictly positive okay so this is a scaling argument uh, this is of course not rigorous in the mathematical sense as i said uh, in some cases it can be proved uh, but only case by case this is one thing uh, of course you see i am talking about relevance of the the disorder and it's clear that uh, a nice you know, an alternative way and more precise way to do that, uh, at least as a theoretical physicist would do, is to use uh, the renormalization group. And there you would see indeed that depending on alpha, the disorder becomes relevant or irrelevant, or the sign of alpha. There are various ways actually to, 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 uh, to, to give or say explain this, uh, this, uh, this Harris uh, uh, criterion. Um, there is a huge literature on that. Uh, I just tried to uh, explain what uh, how Harris uh, did, uh, did, did, the, uh, did the, the argument. I hope uh, you will find it uh, convincing. Now, of course, uh, when alpha is zero, you see that there is actually uh, some ambiguity because the disorder uh, is marginal in this case, and in this case, the Harris criterion doesn't 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 say anything. Well, this situation alpha equals to zero is actually not so uh, so uh, so uh, uh, crazy, but this is actually the case. So in D equal to for Ising, so this is the pure system. Sorry, I should add I should add pure. So for instance, in D equals two for Ising, well, there is an exact result. This is the exact result of Honsager. And it turns out that uh, in this case, alpha pure is equal to zero strictly. So in this case, you need to go beyond this simple analysis. And uh, what we, what you would show is that uh, the disorder in this case is relevant, but, mar but marginally so. In D equal three, uh, okay, okay, do that. 
uh, in equal three uh, for rising again. Uh, alpha pure is equal to 0 0.1, which is strictly positive, and this order is also relevant. So in this case, uh, this means that, uh, yeah, I should say something uh, uh, that um, this criterion actually doesn't tell you uh, what remains of this transition in the presence of disorder. Okay, it simply says whether uh, the disorder is important or not. And in particular, it doesn't even say uh, whether, for instance, the phase transition is completely destroyed or whether you would flow to another uh, fixed point, which is not the, the, the pure rising fixed point. Uh, and uh, or in some cases, it might even be that the disorder grows, so is relevant, but it grows unboundedly. And this is the case, for instance, in the zero temperature fixed points that we will study in a minute. Uh, and in this case, you need some kind of uh, strong disorder or infinite randomness fixed point uh, uh, to, to study them. So it doesn't say anything uh, about that. Now, it turns out that uh, for the models that I've mentioned here, so for Ising in D equals two or in D equals three, um, there is still a critical point. And so that means that there is still a second order phase transition, but the exponents are different. At least in D equals to three, and they are clearly different. And uh, one can actually um, one can actually um, uh, compute them using uh, RG techniques. Uh, you have a fixed point, which is again, which you can again control perturbatively around the dimension uh, D equals to four. In D equals two, uh, as you may guess, uh, since it is marginal, this will not affect really the exponents, but this will just induce some logarithmic corrections to the, uh, to the behavior uh, that you know for the pure systems. Last remark is that uh, I have actually um, treated here the Ising model, but of course, uh, this is more general, and this criterion actually applies to a wider uh, class of, of systems uh, based, again, uh, on the uh, specific heat exponents. As I mentioned also, and I will finish by sorry. that. On the, oh, sorry, yes, please. Um, so you said you, you could do the same thing for the random field, but uh, would you get the same criterion or uh, that's just for the random bond? Yeah, basically you would say you get the same criterion. Yeah, absolutely. You would, you, 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 that, that, would, that would give you the same criterion. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So, one thing, of course, is that this this criterion is 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 not is not rigorous, uh, and you can actually have um, cases where uh, this might not be completely under control. It turns out that there is uh, uh, there is one theorem related to this to this question, which is a, a true mathematic I mean true rigorous theorem in the in the mathematical sense that I will just uh, give you. And so that's a remark. Uh, and this is really a real statement. And this is a theorem which is due by uh, Chase Chase Fisher and Spencer. It's a very nice, uh, it's a PRL from a uh, physical review letter uh, from 86, very nice paper. Uh, and it gives something uh, which is the following. So it says that um, if the system, uh, if the, the disordered systems exhibit Uh, a continuous phase transition, so a second order of phase transition, then necessarily one has that the new of the disordered system times D uh, is always greater or equal than 2. Okay, so essentially it means that either 
the behavior of the pure system is unaffected, and in that case, you satisfy this bound, essentially. There will be equality there, which is different, but okay. Uh, so in this case, that's what you satisfy. On the other hand, if it's not satisfied, so that means that if the Irish criterion would tell you that the disorder is relevant, then the disordered uh, value of the new exponent is such that this inequality is satisfied. Okay, so it's it's not directly related to the to the it's not the same as the Irish criterion, but it's closely related to that. Uh, and I just wanted to 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 leave you or to to give you this this statement. Is that okay? Okay. So as I said, it might be that, uh, I mean, what happens here is that the system, I mean, this high risk criterion doesn't tell you uh, what really happens uh, if the disorder is relevant, and in particular, what happens uh, if, I mean, whether the, 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 the phases the phase transition is completely destroyed, uh, or uh, what is the kind of new fixed point uh, that one gets. And uh, I would like to treat here uh, one example, uh, which is quite important, uh, which turns out to be a situation where the disorder is, is, is quite strong. I mean, is a relevant perturbation at least, and changes qualitatively the, 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 the behavior of the system uh, and yields uh, what is known under the name of a zero temperature fixed point, and that's the the case of um, the uh, elastic interfaces in disordered media. Okay, so that's one example. I mean, it's not, of course, the 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 the, the, the only one, but it's a, a quite emblematic example of the zero temperature fixed point. And that's the interfaces, elastic interfaces. So we will study this model uh, a bit more in detail in the in the in the in the tutorial. But but I want to uh, discuss or present uh, to present you the the main interesting features of it. So. Well, first, I mean, what what is it about? Uh, I mean, maybe it's. Uh, okay, let me just draw a picture of what the system is uh, in, a, say, in a one-dimensional setup. So, you imagine that you have an interface, u, which is parameterized by u of x, which is its height, and so you have you have such such an interface. Say it's it's a finite size L. Okay. And this is just u of x. Okay. Now it's quite important. I already mentioned this example in the one of the first lectures, um, because, for instance, uh, so the idea is that you have this elastic interface. I will be a bit more precise in a minute, and you add this order to it. So that means that <clears throat> there are some pinning centers uh, where the where the, the if you want the the uh, the interface gets stuck. So for instance, you might think of this elastic interface as a domain wall uh, between uh, a domain of plus spins, separating a domain of plus spins, for instance, and the domain of minus spins in an Ising model. Okay, so if you think about Ising, for instance, uh, you could have plus spins there, Minus minus one there, okay. And imagine that you have impurities in your sample. Then, for some reason, it will be more favorable for the interface to go through these impurities. For instance, non-magnetic impurities, because it will avoid to break magnetic bonds. And this is uh, uh, such a situation, okay. And a lot of the low temperature tem properties of this model here can be understood by analyzing the statistics or the, the, the properties of this line. Now, as I said, it turns out that this model is described by a zero temperature fixed point uh, in the following sense, that usually uh, when we discuss phase transitions, 
we know uh, we, you have seen that these this transitions are actually governed by a competition between uh, essentially energy and entropy, order and disorder, if you want. Uh, but entropy, of course, means that the temperature, I mean, plays a role at, 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 at finite temperature, of course. Um, and uh, that causes uh, typically the, the existence of a phase transition in an Isaac model. Now, it turns out that in such models, uh, the entropy plays a very minor role. And instead, <clears throat> one has uh, a competition between, uh, I mean, it's, it's purely, if you want, uh, the, the entropy doesn't play any role. And the, the, whole, the whole problem has to do with the min min minimization of, of the energy of the system. Okay? So in that sense, this is a zero temperature fixed point, because uh, what you really want to understand is how to minimize uh, the configuration of your system no matter uh, about what happens uh, about the entropy. So if you really look at this system uh, from the renormalization group point of view, well, you realize that temperature is kind of coping constant. You need to renormalize the temperature, such as the, the G uh, coping constant in the FIFO theory. And what you realize is that, at least in most of the cases, um, the temperature actually goes to zero uh, when uh, I mean when, when this is in the thermodynamic limit, okay. So when when, uh, when you implement the RG transformations, so this is uh, this is what we mean by a zero temperature fixed point. And as I said, um, what we need to do here, uh, and I will not comment too much on that, but the zero temperature fixed point, uh, they are typically described by a particular quite particular RG treatment. So in field theory. Uh, one needs to introduce uh, a functional RG. And that's what I meant uh, before, is that you really need to implement a functional renormalization, um, where instead of following only a coupling constant, you really need to follow a full function. And for those of you who are following the lectures by uh, Camille Aron and uh, Kai Wieser, probably you have heard about, about this about this system. So what is the, 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 the energy or what is the, the partition function then of such, of such a polymer? Well, uh, it's, it's relatively, I mean, I will not do a theory of elasticity, but uh, basically the, you have two terms then uh, in, 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 your, in your Hamiltonian. Uh, is, uh, one is related to the elasticity and the other one is related to, to the disorder, okay? So let's uh, look at, in detail at this elastic line. Well, there is an assumption that I should already do here is that I assume that the disorder is not too strong in the following sense that uh, I can assume that this parameterization actually makes sense. That means that uh, I assume uh, that I, there is no what is called overhangs. That means that the interface doesn't do some strange things like that. It could do that, right? Uh, I assume that it's not possible because in this case, I would be in trouble. U of X would be what? Would be this, that, or that? So I assume that there is no overhangs and that I can really have a, a, a nice parameterization, as I mentioned upstairs. Now, the elastic energy uh, is usually uh, quite simple, no? It's, it's just uh, gamma, so which is simply the surface tension, times the length of your the length of the line, and this is just the surface tension. Okay. Now, gamma dl. I mean, if I just uh, use this parameterization that I showed you here, well, gamma dl would be simply the square root of du square plus dx square. Okay, so another way of writing that is just uh, to write as I did in the notes. Uh, this is just the integral from zero to L dx of one plus du dx squared. I'm just illustrating it on the one dimensional case, but of course one could say, or one could look at what happens uh, in higher higher dimensions. And now the idea is that you assume that this guy, the UDX is actually quite small. So you expand this term here, and uh, first term that you would get is simply gamma L, 
okay? And then you get the first non-trivial term, which is the term related really to, to the elasticity, which is this du dx. Okay, so that's, that's the elastic term. Now, of course, uh, You, it turns out that this model, I will not comment too much, but uh, with, this, with, with some of you, at least uh, the, the, the ones that uh, were following the course uh, that we gave with Julio on the first semester, uh, there is a nice connection between the, uh, between the uh, partition function of this, uh, this polymer and uh, the, Brownian, the Brownian particle. I will not comment too much. I wrote something in the in the notes, and uh, there is a nice connection between the the this and and and, and Brownian motion. But I will not I will not use it here. So that's that's the pure case. Okay. Now what happens in when you add the disorder? So of course you need to have a a, a contribution in your energy in your Hamiltonian, which takes into account the fact that your polymer here or your interface. Once, I mean, is pinned by these by these uh, disordered pinning centers, and that leads to uh, a Hamiltonian, uh, which is now the sum of of over two components, uh, one which is the elasticity, of course. I will, for the moment, here discard this term here, right? Because this is just a constant. I can just get rid of it. Constant in the sense that it does not depend on the configuration of the of the of of, of the of the line. And now I will add uh, a term which is which mimics this disordered uh, potential, which is a function both of x and u of x. Okay, so it's clear that it depends on both x. Okay, so the, 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 this v, I mean, will depend on this coordinate here, but it will also depend on u of x. Okay, so typically uh, the pinning center or the pinning force is exerted here, for instance, but not there. Okay, so that means that the potential here will be uh, negative for this value of u of x and essentially uh, much higher in that region. Okay, so that means that this v, you see, uh, is a kind of, I mean, depends on these two, on these two variables. That that's important to realize. And because it's uh, a, a random term which mimics the disorder, uh, this is uh, a Gaussian. So this is a, uh, so this is supposed to mimic the, the the pinning centers, while this is just the elastic. Okay. Now this guy, uh, of course. It will be it would be as as you did in in spin glasses. Uh, it would be very complicated to say something for a given realization of the disordered system. But what we would like to to say is something uh, some kinds of uh, typical uh, properties, some kind of average properties. And the v of x here will be taken as a as a Gaussian random variable. Okay. So typically v of x. So v of x and u. Sorry. Uh, is a Gaussian random variable. So it's a field, actually. It's, it's a Gaussian field, I should say. Uh, it's of zero, zero mean. And with some correlations in general, uh, which I will just define in this way. So V of XU. V of x prime u prime, uh, that will be something. Uh, okay, so it will be a function of x minus x prime, and I will have a certain correlation length, which I will call psi in this direction along along that direction here, and I will have another uh, which is actually unimportant. So eventually, this can be taken as a delta function, uh, and then I will have another quantity here, u of u minus u prime divided by rp. So I have two lengths. One is called xi, the other one is called rp. 
and that corresponds to the correlation uh, along that direction for xi and that direction for rp okay they are typically uh, very rapidly decaying functions uh, but already at this level here one can understand that the situation is 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 is, is not is not trivial and the reason is that the comp there is some competition if you want uh, between these two terms okay uh, between elasticity on the one hand and the pinning on the other hand one way to see that is simply to look at what happens at t equal to zero because if you look at t equal to zero uh, there is some kind of frustration in the system there is some kind of frustration because i mean which results uh, really uh, from the competition between elasticity and pinning so let's if you would have only elasticity at equal to zero if you want to minimize the energy of the system it's clear that to minimize such a term here is simply to have du dx equal to zero okay that means the flat initial configuration flat flat configuration okay so at equal to zero that's what you would expect no the system would be uh, completely flat well on the other hand uh, because of these pinning centers there at zero temperature well clearly uh, you would like to distort this configuration such that it passes through all these pinning centers so there is a kind of optimization to find but all of, I mean, the, the, but these two guys, elasticity versus, uh, I mean, disorder, if you want, uh, which would lead to some, uh, to a rough interface. And that will lead to some complicated optimization problem uh, that are in general not so easy to solve. So how do you solve this problem? Well, uh, of course, if you really want to uh, to make a precise description, uh, you would like to compute the uh, the log of z and average it over the, the the disorder. And to do that, you would like to introduce replicas, as you have seen in the um, in the uh, in the spin in the spin glass cases. But of course, in these cases, you should take care of one thing, which is that these are not mean field models. Okay, so. There's no guarantee that uh, the, 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 the replica type of calculations with the uh, replica symmetry breaking will, will be a good way to, 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 to do that. Uh, it will, of course, for some kind of mean field description of, of these models. Uh, but in principle, that's true that one, one should introduce replicas and see what's going on. And in fact, in the tutorials, that's what we will do. Okay, so we will treat one example in 1D, one special instance of this F and J. Well, they are, they are simply delta functions, both of them. And you will see that it's related to some, and one, one can do computations there using replicas. And uh, one can actually uh, go quite far in the, in the description of, of this model. But before doing that, I just would like to show you uh, an approximation which actually has been extremely successful. Um, which is a kind of minimal model uh, to take into account of, of that. And Excuse this me? minimal model, oh, oh sorry, yes. Um, I, I was just wondering, is there a frustration only at t equals zero or? Yeah, okay. Uh, <clears throat> the thing is that in principle at t, when t, you're right, I mean, in, in principle, that, that, that would be true, that will be true at any temperature, but it's less clear from that point of view here because uh, as soon as t is finite, well, uh, there is no reason to have du dx equal equal to zero, right? So that's true that depending on temperature, uh, you would have you would, you will have I mean uh, uh, the fluctuations of the lines will be uh, more or less important. At low temperature, they will be low. And at high temperature, they will be rougher. The the, the 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 interface would be rougher. But nevertheless. At finite, at finite temperature, you cannot really say that the, 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 the elasticity enforces something completely flat. Okay, I mean there will be some entropy effects basically uh, that, 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 that would play a role. It turns out that on large scales, 
as I said, uh, you will be dominated by uh, a zero temperature fixed points, which means that, in fact, even at finite temperature on large scale, uh, you have also uh, frustration. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay. So, yeah, so this model is actually uh, due to a famous Russian physicist, which is called Larkin, uh, who was a student of Sakharov. And he actually uh, proposed a very simple model, which is that, okay, you have a, uh, in principle, uh, you have, uh, uh, you are experiencing uh, a true disordered potential, but one could think of linearizing this, uh, this potential around one minimum. And that means that uh, we would just uh, make, uh, so try to, to uh, treat the disorder in perturbation uh, theory and linearize the, the, the potential for, for small u around the minimum. And uh, that's, uh, that's a model of, it's a random force model, actually. And then that tells you that this h of u of x is just uh, gamma by 2 dx du. Uh, du dx squared plus some term, which is just linear here. Okay, so you 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 just make a linearization of this model of so you you linearize the Hamiltonian around its minimum. Okay, so around the minimum of the full the full comp of of the full Hamiltonian, right? So the elastic property plus v. So I'm not saying that you you linearize v around its minimum, but you linearize the full Hamiltonian around its minimum. And that's what you would say, okay? So that amounts to a linearize around the minimum of H, okay? So there will be somewhere one configuration. In fact, there will be many of them, but assume that uh, you have, make, you, you make this, this kind of, of, of uh, and this guy is a random force. That means that in the simplest uh, setting, uh, I will again assume that this is just zero on average, and it has some And I will call this delta. Okay, that's the standard. Uh, there is no delta square here. We'll just call it delta. Uh, so, so this is this delta. Of course, is different from delta h and delta j that we have seen before. Right? This is completely different. So, then it's easy. It's relatively easy to 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 find the minimum of this uh, of this of this configuration. And basically, uh, you just uh, minimize this Hamiltonian now. Uh, by uh, well, basically uh, writing the Euler-Lagrange equation, right? So you are just uh, you minimize h of u of x in the presence of h. Minimization. So that means you, you just write the Euler-Lagrange equation. I think that's that's the best way to to to, to do it here. That means that uh, you will write that ddx of, uh, say, delta h, well, uh, sorry, of your Lagrangian. Okay, so you just write it as, sorry, the integral from 0 to L dx. So you have, I define some Lagrangian. Uh, in this case, I, I will call it. Uh, well, Lagrangian is not is not is not the right name. Let me call it uh, H, which is now a function of du dx and u. And then I just do a d dx of H du dx x. Sorry. Of delta of this divided by du dx minus 
uh, yeah, these are not deltas. I'm sorry. They are just partial derivatives minus this is the density of Hamiltonian minus ddh over d d uh, d u okay equal to zero okay so what 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 does it give well it's relatively simple this will just give here gamma the second derivative and delta h delta u is just h is equal to zero and okay i will actually impose uh, one of the boundary condition i mean okay um, I, I impose the fact that i mean this is I, I i imagine that i am fixing the polymer on one hand so i'm I, I suppose that i have my polymer which is like that okay so i suppose that u at x equal to zero which is equal to zero can you still see on the blackboard because the light i mean has changed quite a bit here on the on the on the room it's okay it's okay so I will assume that u of x is equal to zero at x equal to zero. Okay. So that's fine. I mean, you can easily. Uh, so you can integrate this uh, this equation. Uh, in principle, I will have uh, two. Uh, okay, let's do it. So I will just uh, write uh, u of x as one over gamma integral from zero dx dy integral from zero to y dz h of z and then I have two two constants ax and b so because of that b equal to zero okay so I still have one unknown and the way I determine A is that I will inject back this formula into H itself and minimize H with respect to A. Okay, so that's the standard way to do. Okay, so uh, so that means that I will eventually minimize the solution, uh, minimize H with respect to A, and that determines A. Okay, so that that's the way to determine to determine A. And I have at the end of the day I have an explicit an explicit expression for u. So this is fine. Uh, so what I want to say is that I mean I am further minimize h of u of x with respect to a. And that gives me an expression for a. Okay, so you can just do do it. Uh, this is I didn't do that in the notes, but uh, I can give you some. I have notes for that. I mean, it's it's quite simple. Okay. So the integral of zero L. So I have a system of finite size there. Now, at the end of the day, uh, you can really uh, you can really compute. Uh, you can really compute uh, u of x uh, from that formula okay and if you uh, if you do that and if you do the 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 the, the, the whole computation um, one can eventually compute u of x and let's so we get uh, one gets so one gets u of x the expression is a bit bit complicated, but but not that much. And finally, from it, I just would like to evaluate u of l. So I just would like to understand. I want to 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 really compute the uh, the fluctuations of the. Uh, that's what I want to compute, right? I have my my polymer, and I want to to see uh, what is the displacement. Of the endpoint here as a function of L. Okay, so I can compute U of L eventually. So I compute U of L, and U of L turns out to be quite simple. It's just uh, 
minus one over gamma. Okay, there are some integra integ integration by parts to, to, to do, I mean, but okay, th there is nothing really nasty there, nor complicated, but I get this expression, okay. So now I want to say, to, to say something about the fluctuations of this U of L. So maybe, uh, Let's, let's do that, I mean, because it's, it's quite simple. I will not reproduce the computation, but if you take the average, uh, it's clear that because the average of H is zero, then U of L on average is zero. And then you can also compute the second moments uh, because you know the, 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 I mean, basically from that, it's easy to compute that. This is done in the notes in detail. This is just zero, but this is quite trivial. And what I am after instead is the expectation value of the square. Okay. And I can easily compute that by using this. If I do that, what I have to obtain is that this quantity, and that's a nice result, an interesting result, uh, which is delta divided by three gamma squared times L cube. Uh -huh. Okay, so so why is it in, why why is it interesting? Well, there are two remarks that I want to do here. So that's the result of Larkin. Now the first remark is that if you look at the pure system, and if you have only elasticity. Well, using the analogy with Brownian motion, uh, it's quite easy to see that u square of L will be like Brownian motion of size L, and that would give u square of L proportional to L. So if I look at this average, uh, say pure, uh, I would get something like t to the power L. Well, of course, at t equals zero, this would be zero exactly, but. Uh, so the first observation is that it seems from that computation that the disorder here actually leads to fluctuations which are much stronger than the thermal fluctuations, okay? So that means that uh, this, uh, the, the disorder, fluctuations due to the disorder are much larger than in the pure system. So that means that you immediately see here that the disorder plays, plays a very important role. Now, the second observation, and that will be connected to what we will see in the tutorial, is that it turns out that these results uh, that you obtain with the Larkin model is not the correct one. And in fact, uh, the exact result for large L, so if you look at the system, the exact result for large L is actually, uh, is actually quite, quite different. And instead of uh, being U of L proportional to L to the three by two, it turns out that U of L scales like L to the power two by three. Okay, so it's one over this exponent. So the exact result, which is obtained by much more elaborated methods, is quite different and gives something which is U square of L, expectation value of the disorders for, for the pure, for the, the true disordered system, uh, is actually L to the power four third, okay? Which is different from L cube. Okay. So it's still, uh, you, remember, you see that the exact result is still uh, larger than the, the pure elastic, elastic uh, regime or the, purely, the, the pure system, but still, I mean, it's much less than, than, than this L cube. And why, why, why I mean, where, where, where does the, the problem come from? 
Well, the problem comes from this approximation that we have done there, which is that we have linearized around a minimum of h. But what happens is that uh, on large scales, if you start to look at what happens on larger scales, um, there is not a single minimum, but in fact, you will have many, many different minima. And that makes that this approximation is, 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 is wrong. That means that this linearization at least breaks down above a certain length. So what I want to say is that uh, the reason why, uh, the, the reason for this discrepancy is that there is in fact uh, a lot of uh, a lot of minima. So that's the, the, the cartoon that I that I have in, in, in my notes that I will not reproduce here, but just write the reason. Uh, the reason is that there are actually many different distinct minima. And all these minima, in fact, uh, needs need to be uh, need to be taken taken into account. So that means that uh, this certainly is correct only on small scales. So that means that this is only correct provided that your system doesn't uh, doesn't uh, explore other minima. And this is uh, this says basically that um, this uh, this approach, the Larkin approach. Uh, is correct only uh, when basically u uh, u of l uh, is less than the typical scale of the uh, or the correlation length of the potential in the u direction. Okay, so that tells you that as long as u square of l is less than r p square, where r p is the correlation length of the potential. Because as long as the, I mean, as soon as, sorry, as soon as the U of L becomes of the order of the correlation length of the potential, then there is a, a, a wide chance, there is, a, there is some probability, non-zero non probability, that it will explore another minima. So that means that, uh, in principle, you should really sum over all these different minima. And uh, the way to do that is precisely uh, to use this uh, uh, relatively sophisticated method uh, of uh, renormalization group, functional renormalization group, I mean, which are needed because of that, of that problem. Uh, you also notice that this gives you, uh, this allows you to, to give uh, an estimate of the lock-in length, which is the length above which this approach fails, and you can just compute this LC by injecting the formula that we have found above, this delta over 3 gamma square L cube, less than RP square, and that gives you LC, uh, which is simply of order, and that's well known in this, in this, in this, uh, in this problem. Uh, this is known as the lock-in length. Now, just to conclude uh, and to make a, a connection uh, to what I've said before, it turns out that the result that you obtain via this Larkin model, that means linear, linearizing around a single minimum, uh, is equivalent to this approximation or to this uh, phenomenon that I described under the name of dimensional reduction. So Larkin model is actually equivalent to To dimensional reduction and to go beyond that, well, either you need to go to do this uh, uh, functional renormalization group techniques uh, where you will find some uh, quite uh, non-trivial structure of the fixed points, or in the language of replica, this can be seen as a replica symmetric uh, solution. And if you want to go further, 
then you need to find for a solution with a replica symmetry uh, where, 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 where the, the replica symmetry is broken. Okay, so that's another way out of dimensional reduction that, as we have seen before, but that's yet another incarnation of this of this problem. Okay, so that's more or less uh, it. Uh, I was a bit fast on this uh, on this last part, uh, but okay. I mean, we will. Uh, I mean, the the, the tutorial is uh, to a large extent. Uh, devoted to uh, to this model, uh, not completely on this aspect of lock-in, but uh, on an exact solution of it. So I hope uh, we can discuss a bit further uh, in the yeah in the case where you you miss something or where you have further questions on it. So before I, I take questions, if any, I just want to mention right now that uh, the the tutorial they will take place on the uh, on Zoom, okay. So that would be nice if we can meet there at uh, 10 past 4, if, 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 if it's fine for you. On Zoom, okay. I will stay here, but uh, we will do. I, I will. I will use my my laptop, and uh, we will do as as we did last time. Okay. Are there any questions? Okay. So, okay, so uh, I hope that uh, it was clear enough and uh, we will uh, just uh, meet in, uh, say, 15 minutes from now on Zoom. <laughs>